Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me today in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and oh yeah, that sometimes messy thing that we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, we are back for yet another episode, and I'm actually here with a brand new friend of mine, Mike Morby. Mike, I hope it's okay to call you a friend. I, I love being able to, as, as I was saying to you before we start recording, connect with photographers in our industry, but thank you so much for making time for our podcast today. Yeah, thank you. You can call me a friend now. We'll, we'll see at the end of the interview. But as of now, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Well, I, for those of you listening in, you know, I, I, it, this might be something that kind of comes up in your mind. You're like, what he he calls these guests friends. In some cases, he hasn't had the opportunity to meet. Um, that's just my personality. I I love, and I know we've talked about this in the podcast before. I think there is a lot of value and ultimately even fulfillment to be had through being willing to put ourselves out there and go beyond the surface level and connect with those that we engage with, whether it's clients or photographers or otherwise. And uh, this this podcast has been a wonderful opportunity for that. But thanks again, Mike. And, and really, I just want to jump right in because we have a lot to cover. And I'm curious, just to get us started, what is one of the most impactful lessons that you've learned as a business owner so far? What would that one piece of advice be that you would share to a fellow photographer if you had the chance? Yeah, that, that's always a tough question, you know, because it's uh, everything with business is very multi-layered. But I think in my experience and also just with coaching and reaching out to other photographers, I think the number one thing is that building a sustainable business takes time. I think, you know, we're in a quick fix on demand society and people want to know how do I get as many leads as possible or grow my business as fast as possible. And so they try some of the quick fix options. But, you know, I always encourage people that to build something sustainable, you need you need time and, and patience. Well, and then innate to that conversation as well, and I've realized this, at least personally anyway, even in the last few months, is the significance of consistency. So you're right, we have to be willing to, we have to be okay with the fact that this isn't going to, to happen immediately. And in order to get to that place, that, that, that kind of overarching goal for our business, the financial goals or otherwise, we also have to be willing to be consistent. We can't throw down for a week or two or a month or two even and work really, really hard and then get frustrated when we don't see the results that quickly and then kind of give up and pull back. We have to be consistent in our effort, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because I'm I'm sure you've been in the industry a really long time, you know, as well. And, And just with businesses in general, once you think you've arrived or you've done what you need to do, then, you know, there's other people out there with a lot of drive and passion that will then, you know, pass you uh, and you got to keep up with the times and you know things like that so yeah consistently working hard yes is really important as well i'd agree and you you mentioned being in the industry for a while uh, really i should do a better job of starting our podcast interviews with this information <laughs> but first of all you've been in the industry how long so technically my my first wedding uh i photographed in 2001 okay. so 18 years yeah i was a terrible photographer. Well, hopefully past couples from back then aren't listening to this. <laughs> but from 2001 to I would say like 2009, I really didn't know what I was doing. I was shooting in full auto and, you know, on camera flash pointed directly at the couple all the time. But in 2009 is when I started taking it seriously and my gr- business grew rapidly from 2009 on. So I would say 10 years but technically 18 years if you count my first wedding. Sure. Uh, 2001 was actually when I shot my first wedding as well. I charged 350 bucks. Um, I was shooting I charged 500. So I, 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 I was more expensive. You, <laughs> you had a leg up on me. Well, I shot that first wedding and I actually missed the, the kiss during the ceremony. And, you know, I mean, I, I tried to give myself some kind of context to what it even meant to be a wedding photographer getting into going to photograph that wedding. And, um, and fortunately 
everything but that first kiss, um, I managed to capture that day. And the clients were so gracious um, that they allowed me to literally go back and we, we got the wedding party, the minister, the couple, of course, and set up that shot on stage, just like they had been in the ceremony, captured that, put it in the proof book, and you wouldn't have known a difference. And they were so, so kind about it. Um, I was I was lucky for that. But uh, I know 2001, I mean, this is back in the days of film, of course, as well. And um, that the learning curve from there uh, was pretty steep for our business as well. I, I get what you're talking about, kind of learning to develop awareness about the, the technical elements of photography that take you way beyond just point and shoot. And, and to that point, I was complimenting you on, on your Instagram feed before we got started. I have to share this with our listeners. For those of you listening in, of course, we'll list, link to this in the show notes. But if you go to Morby, M-O-R-B-Y, photography on Instagram, and uh, by the way, the website as well as morbyphotography.com, you've got to check out this this work coming out of Mike Studios. It's truly beautiful. And, and not only beautiful, particularly in its use of light, but but also the variety of images. I'm just, I'm really, really impressed by that, Mike. So we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes. But you are a wedding photographer based in Philadelphia. And like I said, I, I need to do a better job starting off the, the conversations with that information. But um, I know that on your website, something that is alluded to is the significance that you put in your own life of simple living, uh, quality time in particular. So this is a good segue for me into my next question, which is how you go about creating that free time, that space for the significant people in your life or to do things that you enjoy. Is there a particular workflow tip or technique that you have implemented in your business that gives you that time? Yeah. And, and pr- prior to answering that, if, if you don't mind, I sure. I coach a lot of wedding photographers. And when somebody is starting, so I, you and I, we've been established in what we're doing for a long time. So we can put certain parameters on our business that I think some people that are just starting out probably can't do okay. right away. So I do always encourage people that are starting out like you might have to put in really long days and really long weeks for the first couple of years, knowing that eventually you'll want to get to, you know, some, so I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I always, I always tell people, you gotta, you can't all of a sudden say, I'm only gonna, you know, shoot one wedding a weekend and I'm only going to work one day a week when you're just starting your business. Sometimes you got to get through that beginning part. Yeah, well, I'll actually respond to that too because you make an interesting point there. Uh, I I started Photographers Edit. I mean, I can speak to this with regards to photography, but it's particularly relevant with Photographers Edit with the goal of creating a business that would generate passive income for me. And at long story short, within the span of maybe a year and a half to two years, certainly by three years or so, I was literally working as little as about four hours a week. And the company yeah. was running and it was growing. And that was a goal of mine. There was a book that came out around this time called The Four Hour Work Week. And um, a lot of people laughed at it. The principles innate to that book were at least in some ways similar to what I was trying to implement in my, my business. And I literally made that work for me. The caveat that I would add is that had I put, say, 15 or 20 hours a week into, into the company back in you know, 2010, 2011, we'd be at a different place right now. So certainly getting started, it's important to put the work and the time and the effort and the energy in. And, and then it can, it, well, not only can, but it likely will have a payoff in the long run. But understanding that you do have to, to put that extra work in is, is important. I, I would definitely agree. And that's going to look differently for different people. What is it? What, I guess what I should ask here is what did it look like for you, say, 10 years ago? And what does it look like now? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, you got to set time limits on it. So I'm not going to work to the bone for five years. Like you said, maybe a year with the goal of training, equipping and building. So then, yeah, like this is the goal of the business. And I might, you know, have to work this way for a little bit to get to that goal. But yeah, I mean, 10 years ago, I was uh, doing all of my own editing. Photographer's edit was not a thing back then. <laughs> and uh, I was shooting it was just me at the time, a sole photographer. Now we have four wedding photographers, a family photographer, my wife, who's like financial and workflow guru. And then we have a studio manager. But um, yeah, back 10 years ago, I was pretty much doing everything. Uh, and then I was shooting family sessions, you know, 45 weddings a year, all my wow. own ed- working, just crazy amount of hours. And I was also, I went full time with photography in 2012. And so I actually shot 37 weddings 
in 2012 while also working full time and doing all of my own editing. So yeah, working crazy hours. Yeah, I was going to say that sounds like kind of a, a nightmare. What what were you doing full time at that point? Uh, I was actually a youth pastor okay. for five years. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's a taxing job. I know maybe is not the right word there, but that's a taxing way to spend time as far as a profession is concerned. I know I, I was yeah. very much in in that environment for some time. Yeah. And now seven years later, all all the high school students are getting married. So it's it paid off. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. But I think so to answer your initial question, I, I think the big um, two, two big shifts that happened for me. One was uh, a streamlined workflow. I began timing myself on every single task and seeing where where could I save even seconds, you wow. know, by, you know, using when I'm calling the one, two and three on my keyboard rather than like the one and the zero. So I don't have to go over yep. my hand or all these like little things like editing board, whatnot, you know, just saving a ton of time. And then probably the, the biggest shift for me, and it's been in more re- recent years is time blocking just because within business, we can run ourselves into the ground because there's so much to do so many tasks that we can, you know, dive into. And, and that's what I was doing back then is I, there was no boundary uh, within work and life. It all just blended together. But now, you know, I time block Tuesday and Wednesday or my work day in office. And I, as hard as I can, I try to stop work when my kids get off the bus Monday and Thursday are my wife's day to work. But then it's also like our day to, you know, do something that we might want to do on my Tuesday and Wednesday. And I try to do Tuesday as like task oriented stuff. Okay. And Wednesday is like goal future things. But yeah, time blocking was huge. And now because of that, you know, I make dinner every night. I have breakfast in the morning with my kids and we make dinner at night. And my wife and I read at night. I've read four hour work week, you know, like you talked about, mentioned that book. And so just really slowing down and saying, this is time to work. And then this is time to not work. I'll still respond to like inquiries or things like that. But in general, really just trying to value time away from actual tasks at hand by time blocking my week. And this is interesting on multiple levels, but you mentioned, you said Tuesday and Wednesday or Tuesday and Thursday are your days. Tuesday and Wednesday. That's why we're talking on a Wednesday. (laughs) Fair enough. Okay. So then I'm curious, and maybe our, our other listeners are curious as well what what's happening the rest of the days of the the so-called work week so monday is it's my wife's day to get anything she needs to get done with the business or if she wants to make a doctor and then i have um right now we have nine seven and four year old so the nine and seven year old are in school but the four year old uh is only two day a week preschool so on on monday i'm with her i'm i'm hanging out with her i'm food shopping i'm reading, I'm taking a nap, you yes. know, maybe in the afternoon, uh, Thursday, the same thing. Okay. Uh, so exercise is mixed in there. Yeah. Uh, Friday and Saturday are our wedding days. I actually now only shoot one wedding a weekend. So, and then Sundays are a day off and we're actually really trying to implement Sabbath rest on, on Sundays, which has been difficult, but you know, staying away from any really task oriented things right. uh, on Sunday. So so yeah, it's really time time with kids, time to get stuff done around the house, to food shop. My wife and I are really 50-50 on the business and on home life. So I love that. She's working, I'm not. And then evenings are we try as best we can to take it slow, eat together. If we're going to watch TV, just watch a little bit, but spend that last hour of the day really reading and working our way into sleep and then waking up early, you know, as well. So yeah, that's kind of what the rest of the week looks looks like. And it obviously that's the perfect world, but you know, sometimes things come in like a bridal show or an event that I have to be a part of. But for the most part, we try to stick to that schedule. That's really, really cool. Yeah. And I knew when I when I asked you about the rest of the days, I knew that your wife had some work days in there as well. But I was just curious how you were spending your time. I love the fact that, as you pointed out, you and your wife share not only the business kind of 50-50, but also home life. I, I like that approach to to relationship. I mean, for all the the conversation in our culture about equity when it comes to the sexes, 
um, they're just the simple approach to a relationship of I, I don't like there's no expectation about a particular role going into this relationship. We're, we're in this together. This is a team effort. And this idea that one thing is, is you know, less than who I am is, is just a really egotistical approach to, to take. And, and I like the open mindedness that you and your wife were exhibiting. What's your wife's name one more time? Uh, Carrie. Carrie, that you and Carrie are exhibiting through that that model of a relationship. I think it's beautiful. You mentioned reading in the evenings too, and that it really is a great way to kind of wind down, to shut down. And by the way, for those of you listening in, you've probably heard this at this point, but reading on your iPhone, reading on an iPad, it's it's giving off that blue light, ideally, and which of course can affect melatonin production in the way that you fall asleep. Uh, the ideally going to a Kindle, like a paper white, for example, is one that I have, or a, a regular book is a great way to go about it, or even an audio book. But I'm curious, Mike, do you and Carrie ever read together? Is that something that you share in, or do you tend to read separately? Well, yeah, we, we read together. We don't read to each other, but we each have a Kindle. Okay. And uh, Libby is amazing because you can check out books for free from the library. Yes. And not to get too geeky, but I know you're a reader as well from your podcast interview that I heard with uh, one of my friends, but yeah. I try to, I try to mix it up and I'll do business. I'll do a business book or like a spiritual book, yeah. but then I'll always buffer it with like a novel. I really like historical fiction to, I go slow through a business book and then I kind of breeze through a novel. It kind of like cleans my palate and uh, allows me then to immerse myself back into business again. I actually really, sometimes I'll read maybe two novels, but but yeah, we just, we lay in bed and we just, we both read on our, I used to read paperback books, but she likes me to like rub her back as we're, we're reading. That's awesome. And I was like, I can't hold a paperback book and do that. So, <laughs> so I got a Kindle for Father's Day. That's so cool. So yeah. And then, you know, we try to sleep from 10 to six and we try to spend the first hour of the morning in silence and solitude before the kids wake up. And yeah. this has all been within the past year and a half, but it's really been life changing. Wow. Wow. I love that. Well, you guys are setting a wonderful example. Even for me, it's inspirational to, to hear that. I, I love this. Ta you were talking about books. And so natural next question is what's one of the most impactful books that you've had the opportunity to read or listen to in the last couple of years? Yeah. So for, for me, it's been built to last. I'm not sure if you've read that one. I haven't not. yet. I've heard of it, but I haven't read it yet. Yeah. Especially since you oversee a a very large team from what it seems like built to last is a phenomenal book about how to build a company that isn't based on the charisma of a leader, but mm. it's, it's built on more foundational things that can last through generations. So they, they survey like Disney, Johnson and Johnson, Marriott, these companies that have lasted hundred years plus some of them. So that's been great. And Another one is Story Brand by Donald Miller. Yeah. Uh, and I really think that's a great book, especially for people trying to find their voice with their business. Um, Story Brand is, is a great read. So, so many, I could, I could list a bunch, but I would say Story Brand and Built to Last most recently. Right now I'm reading Ego as the Enemy uh, and it's really putting me in my place. Mm. So that, that's my current one that I'm really gleaning a lot from as well. You you mentioned story brand. That's one that we've talked about on the podcast quite a bit, and that would certainly be if if I were to recommend a marketing book to any photographer, that would probably be the first one that I'd go to. It's so it's such an easy read. It's so clear that the the I guess the just the style of communication is so easy to follow. It's very much actionable. You know, a lot of business books you read, and there's so much fluff. You have to kind of weed through that to get to something. But I, I love how actionable it is and how practical it is. So. Definitely recommend that. I'll put that in the show notes. And then Built to Last, I'm curious, you, you referenced running a team there. Do you feel like the principles innate to that book are also relevant to sole proprietors? I'm not sure. What, why don't you read it and let me know? <laughs> but I, I feel like it's uh, how, do you, how do you really build a team that has you know, foundational values that can be uh, replicated among different members of the organization. Yeah. I, I really feel like that's for a, even if it's just a two member team, you know, I, I, I don't, I would say story brand more for the sole proprietor, but the, if somebody's running a team, they have a studio manager, editors, you know, things like that, that I think built to last would be more for a multiple uh, person business. 
Got it. Well, but at the same time, when you talk about the significance of values, and we we talk about this notion quite a bit here on the podcast, the idea that uh, we build a, a life first, but then a business that is based on overarching goals and a value set that drives what we do. So we're not just kind of haphazardly running our business. So it seems like there may even be some relevance there, even if yeah. there is a there is a sole proprietor who's picking up that book. Uh, the the E Myth Revisited is a book that comes to mind. When you're talking about that, building a sustainable business, something that's built on principles that don't require just your involvement, but you know something bigger, even if it's a, a, a system or a set of systems that enable that, that business to scale, uh, we'll also link to that book in those show notes as well. But I really appreciate you sharing all of those. What Talk to us. Let's go kind of the direction of photography here for a second. And I'm curious, what is something that is particularly unusual in your camera bag? And this doesn't have to be a camera or a lens or otherwise, but a tool that enables you to be a better photographer. Yeah, honestly, my, the first thing that comes to mind, this will sound really silly, is uh, snacks. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah. You got to share the snacks. What kind of snacks? I just go to, I go to Costco and just buy bulk, you know, energy bars and yeah. trail mix and all that sort of stuff. But I, I slowly snack through, uh, I, you, you'll find by the end of this podcast, I got some weird quirks and I guess ways of doing things, but yeah, I slowly snack through a wedding day because I was finding that having a big lunch, uh, or a big dinner would bog me down yeah. and make me foggy. Yep. And so yeah, just slowly eating through the wedding day makes me not hungry and keeps my energy up because I'm not having a big, you know, meal to that. And then on a more practical level, uh, magma gear has transformed the way that I uh, am able to photograph things, manipulate lights. The what's happened with magma has been um, incredible for the wedding industry. And you know, it's interesting you bring them up because not only have I heard more about them, but I've also seen them, seen their brand and I didn't have the opportunity to use Magmod as a wedding photographer, but what would you say is the, the, the big, I mean, you talk about the impact that it's had in the industry. What is the significance of that impact or more, I guess, better ask, what is underlying that impact? Are there are some principles behind their business model. Is it the actual, the, the workflow? What, what is it? Uh, it's just, it, I would say that ease of use, like they've okay. created, some of their stuff, I, th- I think I'm not really um, into the mechanics and technical of how things are made, but the ease of use is you can, you can swap out modifiers quickly, you know, and effectively and do a wide variety of things. And, you know, it's really allowed just a great controlled use of light. So if I have a ceremony and they've taken the time to create this beautiful ambiance for like an indoor ceremony with candles and lighting and stuff like that, if if I have just on camera flash or, you know, whatever, I'm going to, I'm going to blow out everything that they've spent time to create in the photos where my mag mod allows me to put light in specific places and then still keep the ambiance of the rest of the scene. So it's, it's really been a game changer uh, because, you know, uh, people put so much time and energy into creating uh, an atmosphere yeah. and, knowing how to control your light to supplement that atmosphere and not overwhelm it has magmod allows me to do and i'm not a magmod ambassador or anything but i just yeah i love the way that it's allowed me to keep the ambiance of the scene uh by controlling light through like grids and snoots and you know all the different stuff that they have yeah i would have to say though based on based on the quality of your imagery and looking at that at that instagram feed um, it's, I, I, you, you need to be an ambassador. They need to know more about you, but <laughs> you, you point Thank something you. out about the ease of use. And, you know, I, I think that as photographers, even as, as individual photographers, maybe running a small business and then certainly those larger companies with teams or otherwise understanding the significance of creating an easy user experience, minimizing barrier to entry, if you will, of bringing yeah. on a client and then making it easy to engage with you, to work with you. That that needs to be emphasized, I think, uh, way more than, than than it currently does. And this isn't because it's not just applicable to products. I I love the fact that Magmod has created a product line that is easy to use. I think back to uh, light modifiers that I used in the past. One in particular um, called a Light Sphere, 
And it was it was quite the task to try to put on this light modifier onto the flash that I was using. The idea that you can just grab an accessory from MagMod and, and almost let it drop onto the flash and it attaches just like that. Um, while it, you know, there's a cool factor to it when you start to think about how much time you save because you're able to do that so quickly and focus on the moment and what's yeah. going on so that you can be a better photographer, I think is, is huge. But I think this has application for photographers to anything that you can possibly do. And we spend a lot of time uh, on this at Photographer's Edit as well. Anything that you can do to make it easier for somebody to engage with your brand, do it. Spend the time. Yeah. The investment is so worth it because that experience, the overall experience that they have with you will translate um, not only to happy client, but also to likely more referrals as a result. Yeah, definitely. That's huge. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Of course, we'll link to MagMod in the show notes as well. I've mentioned the show notes a number of times already. For those of you listening in um, and have been listening for a while, you know this. But for those newer to the podcast, go to Boca, B-O-K-E-H, podcast.com. And whatever episode uh, is most recent, you'll see that at the top of the page. But all the the episodes, more recent episodes in particular, have really detailed show notes, timestamps, links to resources, et cetera. So make sure you take advantage of that, uh, particularly with with uh, my conversation with Mike today. Mike, leading up to our conversation today, you'd said this about branding. You said, for branding, I coach people on having branding points that differentiate them from others, add value to the client and that they can consistently deliver on them. And I, I love the way that you explain this idea of a brand position. We talk a lot about brand position here on the podcast, and there seems to be a lot of confusion about what a brand position even is, honestly. Uh, so I, I like the explanation here. We break down each of those three points in a bit more detail for me about how to, to, to be able to communicate a brand position to the client. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I know there's a lot of different, like you said, uh, variety of points of view when it comes to branding. You know, some people think it's just your logo and your website and your colors and, you know, things like that. Yeah, there's there's so much more to that. But one thing that I have honed in on, which you just mentioned, is coaching people through figuring out uh, what their brand is, you know, specific to their business. So yeah, the three things, differentiation, adding value, and then consistency. So the first part of that is what's going to differentiate someone from the competition. And, you know, in the wedding photography industry, it's a saturated market in the Philly area alone. This is going to be somewhat of a guess, but I think there's somewhere around like 1500 photographers on the knot. Wow. Uh, in the, yeah. So it's a, it's a saturated market and a very low barrier to entry. So how do you differentiate yourself? What, what's going to make you stand apart from everybody else. And I think that's true for any business. Um, you know, what differentiates McDonald's from Wendy's, you know? So Wendy's says quality is in our recipe. So obviously that's a knock at McDonald's because you don't know what's in their recipe. <laughs> so <laughs> like what, what's going to differentiate somebody from, from those that are out there. And then the second part of that. So once you've discovered that, then you got to ask yourself the question, does this add value to the client? Hmm. So if I, as a photographer, offer a, uh, a pizza voucher to everybody that books me, yeah, that's going to definitely differentiate me because nobody else is doing it, but is it going to add value to the client? And so once you figure something out, then ask yourself, is this going to make their experience with, their, with me and with their wedding uh, better? And then the final thing is then asking, can I consistently deliver on this? Can I wedding after wedding, client after client produce consistent results? So I know some people that say, I want to be known as the fun photographer. Well, that's great, but can you consistently bring fun? Because I think that's really hard to consistently deliver on, you know, on a wedding day. Well, and it's such an arbitrary term, you know, that that's one of the things yeah. that I've noticed when, when it comes to photographers kind of defining their brand or, or making a statement about their brand, coming up with a tagline. One of the most popular things is, you know, the, the three words I'm joyful and bright and airy or whatever it is, but these arbitrary terms, the question is, what does that actually mean? And I think specificity helps create that differentiation, right? Yeah. Yeah, it does. And like, I love the word specificity as well, because every really strong brand that is out there is very specific hmm. 
on what they have to offer. Like Walmart offers a variety of products, but they're specific on low prices. So if they start offering high priced products, they've gone against their like foundational specific branding point. Yeah. I think like Mercedes came out with a entry level somewhere in like a few years ago, a $25,000 car, yeah, which is totally contrary to what you think of when you think of a, a Mercedes or if like if Nike started offering, you know, high heeled shoes, you'd be like, wow, that's, that's again, specifically what Nike's all about. So yeah, I think specificity in it is, is super important as well. Although I, I'm sure Mike, that you'd be first in line to buy those high heels from, from Nike, right? Well, I petitioned to, to have them start designing those. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm just shooting from the hip with my examples here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just playing with you. But you, you mentioned Mercedes releasing that kind of budget car. Uh, it, it makes me think, too, of Porsche when they came out with the, the Panamera, Panamera, which is almost like a family sedan. And, of course, Porsche does a family sedan on a whole different level. Uh, but it, it is it can be a little bit confusing, at least, to the outside viewer, observer, if you're doing something that doesn't line up with your brand. I, I think about a statement like BMW makes, which is the ultimate driving machine. The cool thing about that statement, if that's their position, and, and it's a pretty cool one at that, it, it opens up kind of a broad range of possibilities with which they can offer a line of products, right? It, it, whether it's a <laughs> whether it's a scooter or a motorcycle, I've owned a BMW myself or a car, the focus is on being the ultimate driving experience and and, yeah. it, and it can fall within that kind of broad statement. But uh, yeah, again, specificity is important and it, not only to differentiate yourself, we're talking about brand position, differentiating yourself, but then it also does something really cool for your business and then it literally guides you or should anyway guide you and the clients that you're going after, the way that you spend your time, the type of products and services that you're offering. It should literally drive all of that. And it makes, honestly, it makes life a lot easier. You don't have to kind of flounder around and wonder what to do next. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You can be very focused and intentional in what you're all about. I actually had my accountant ask me recently, actually, I think you, you had him on your, your show, Mike Clipper. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's my great guy. But he asked me the question the other day, what, what's one thing that I think businesses, photography in particular struggle with? And I said, intentionality and focus. They, they just don't know what they're all about. They're all over the place. They're, they're not in, intentionally running their business and building their business. It's kind of haphazard. But once you start to narrow in on your brand, you, you can be more intentional about what you do. It's so true. And, and I don't want to kind of beat a dead horse here, but we've talked about this, this idea of a brand, uh, not only brand position, but more kind of broadly, the bigger picture view idea, which is, again, being clear about what it is that you're reaching toward in life, letting that drive the business model that you create. And that can literally trickle down to how you spend your time day to day. And then you won't feel like you're floundering around. Um, you actually have something to reach toward and that guides how you spend your time. So that's really, really important. But I love the practicality of how you're going about defining a brand position. First of all, there is the differentiating factor. And, and you know, it, it may actually take some time for those of you listening in, photographers who haven't clearly figured out how you're actually different. And it's not, don't, don't base your differentiating factor in some Lightroom preset that you apply to your image. You got to go deeper than that. It may take a little bit of time to figure it out but figure out what sets you apart or what how you're going to set yourself apart from the other so-called competition in your market. Make sure that that then adds value. That's huge. And we could spend really a whole episode at least on that. And then consistently delivering on that is really important as well. But let's make it even more practical, Mike. How then would we take this idea of a brand position that you just laid out? What is your photography business's brand position? And how did you come about that brand position? Yeah. So it, I don't have a, like a brand position statement or a purpose statement or mission statement. I more have, have broken it down into uh, eight things that I want to be known for. It's, I think it started as about five things when I started going down this path and then it morphed to eight. And then sometimes I'm replacing them. Yeah. The eight things that I want to be known for are my use of light, which you've kind of mentioned already all day wedding coverage uh, in a industry where hourly is, is the dominant yeah. model. Uh, I differentiate through all day coverage, easy to work with. 
is, is so a lot of my decisions that might seem like I'm a pushover are actually because I want to be easy to work with. And those few tough clients every year, you know, I'll kind of bend over backwards for them to, to stick with that point. Response time is huge, especially in a, a day and age when people take forever to respond. I got a, I, I called a couple people to plow our driveway and one person called me back like two weeks later. I'm like, Dude, Whoa. The, the snow melted. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need you anymore. So response time, wedding day expert, able to handle any situation, creativity, and a non-intrusive approach. So those, those eight things kind of drive everything that I put out there, the way I handle myself, you know, all, all of it really comes down to those eight things. There's like peripheral things as well, but those are really my foundational things that I want to be known for. And how did you come about? I mean, I, first of all, you already pointed out how you're looking at the way that the market is behaving and trying to do something different, which in and of itself is a lesson and, and almost like we could stop the podcast here. If those listening in actually took that and applied it to their business, it would make a big difference. But so you're deciding that this list that you've come up with is largely dependent on what the market is doing and you kind of going the opposite direction, which I really love, but were there other things that drove this list or to help you create this list of differentiating factors? Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, part of it's just experiences that I've had with buying decisions. Um, the, uh, easy to work with and, and non-intrusive, you know, approach is kind of in response to, I, I don't like heavy handed, um, sales and, you know, I've, I've made some pretty bad buying decisions because I felt pressured. So I don't want to do that to my clients. Some things just kind of happen, like all day wedding coverage was just what I always did. And so many people were saying that was one of the main reasons that they booked me because they didn't have to worry about me leaving early or showing up at the ceremony. They knew I would be there from an hour before you know, if it's the bride getting into her dress and staying till the end of the reception. So some of the things were just feedback I was getting on why people were booking me. Yeah. And then, and then one other one was uh, online reviews. And I always encourage people that are trying to figure out their brand message to start with looking at their online reviews. What, what are people already saying about them? And then looking and seeing, are there any consistent things that people are raving about their business and then saying, Oh, well, everybody's talking about like one, one person that was in one of my workshops, I was reading through all their online reviews and magician for some reason kept coming up. It came up like three times. Wow. And I was like, man, that's a really cool branding point. You yeah. know, we've through it. Like they're a magician with their, they're making something out of nothing. Um, oh man, I could, I could take that and run with it. Yeah. That, I mean, just even thinking about a simple statement there on their homepage and what they could do with that in their marketing, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you, you slap that on your website on, you know, a photo that's really creative, just saying they were a magician with the camera and, yeah. and then showing stuff in the wedding meeting. So yeah, some of it also came through online reviews. And then like you said as well, I think ex assessing the market and reacting to it is important, but I feel like that's first, you got to figure out what, what do I care about? What do I value? What's important to me? What's sustainable? Um, and then if there's things that you can figure out within there that actually differentiate you and go against the, the overall market, then run with it. But I think just assessing the market and reacting to it is probably not always the most healthy approach, but I think it's, I think it's important to weave that in there as well and say, what, what can I do that's different than, you know, the market at large? Does that last point make sense there? It does. And actually, I wanted to ask a follow-up question to that. When you talk about assessing the market, but not paying too much attention, why, like, what are the potential negative effects from paying too close attention to the market? Undervaluing yourself. So if, if the, let's say the, my area is charging $3,000 for, uh, coverage and digital images, like just a base package to say, okay, I'm going to charge 2,500 to differentiate myself and not really being intentional with how I'm pricing myself, but I'm just reacting to what else is out there. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. What, what could be another example? Maybe right now the, 
the market is very saturated with uh, a light and airy approach. And so just saying, oh, everything's light and airy. So I'm going to go dark and moody and not really, it's more just not really thinking through, is this what I want to, and I think I'm, I'm dark and moody in my photos, but it's because it's what I love. It's how I've been influenced. I was an art major in college. So I was influenced by painters like Rembrandt, Caravaggio, David, that do a very dramatic lighting style. So it's natural to my being, hmm. uh, but I, I, I'm doing it intentionally because I value it, not just because I want to react to what everybody else is doing. Like if I didn't love the dark and moody style, I shouldn't shoot that way just because everybody else is doing something different. So th- I, I would say that's where it can, it can be dangerous if it's uh, not intentional and really core to what you love and believe. Yeah. Obsessing about it can definitely get in the way of being free to focus on being creative yourself. One, uh, you're right that that can also easily distract you from what actually matters to your personal life and the resulting business model as well, especially when it comes to pricing. Like there may be a particular trend in pricing in the industry, but at the end of the day, you've got to make a certain amount of money to pay your bills and reach your financial goals. And and like that's that's how you should set your prices. It's not overly complicated. So it, it can easily distract you as well. But I think that for there to at least be a little bit of awareness is really, really important. And I'll use Photographer's Edit. I rarely talk about Photographer's Edit on the podcast, but I'll use it again as, as an example. When we started years ago, we were running on the the, the brand position of classic post-production, whereas other companies, our primary competition at the time, there was there was a lot of complication in the way that they ran their business model. And the pricing was complicated and, and the, the the actual offerings were kind of complicated to sort through. I wanted to focus on simple, clean, classic post-production and the, the actual interface placing an order with us as a result was also much simpler. And so that was the goal for a while. But then as we watched what the market was doing uh, a number of years ago, it's been four or five years or so ago, we made a shift to custom for a couple of different reasons. One, because of what our clients were asking for, despite the fact that we were offering you know, a simple post-production product or relatively simple and, and focus on classic, the market was still asking for more options. And so we saw that, but not only do we see that, we also saw the market shifting in the direction of these monthly pricing models, which also naturally kind of pushed the, the post-production work to something with less options, less features. And so there was an opportunity for us to, again, pivot and to play against the market while all the while our, our, you know, our ultimate mission really is giving photographers time. So we could, we could position or reposition ourselves and pivot and flex under the guise of, you know, maintaining our mission statement or our, our ultimate goal while also being aware of the market and then adjusting according to the market so that we didn't, we weren't just simply doing the same thing that everyone else was. Uh, yeah. th- does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And that reminds me of the book built to last. So you say saving photographers time, you know, they talk about having those core values that everybody within the organization can, um, you know, having great, they, they actually use the word indoctrination in, in the book yeah. and they even use the word like cult, like atmosphere, but not in the negative sense. But if you're, if one of your core values is um, saving photographers time, then if somebody, if one of your employees is on the phone with a client, they're going to have that in the back of their mind and saying, okay, I I'm going to, even in this phone conversation, I'm not going to be long winded or drawn out or I want to, in this conversation, save them time by not being on the phone forever. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that's, it, then it just starts to, once you have that stuff, it infiltrates every area of your business. It really does. So like with me, with non-intrusive, that is on a wedding day. So if if there's this epic shot, but I have to get in the way or be very noticeable to get it, I will bypass the epic shot in order to stay non-intrusive because that's what I've promised to the client. And even like in the the wedding meeting, I don't ask for a deposit on the spot because I don't want to be intrusive or overly abrasive. Hmm. So I, I let them walk away and say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hold the date for you. And if somebody inquires, I'll let you know all under that 
long-term experience. Like I want them to, I want them to be advocates for my business. And so I'm not looking for this quick fix, quick sale. I want them to have such a great experience that then when they're done, they're going and they're brand ambassadors for me telling their friends about my business and how I handled them from start to finish as a client. Well, you know, there is there is something to be said from uh, about these points that you were making earlier when it comes to how to go about creating a position or a list of differentiating factors at least, which is experience. You, you talked about the significance of experience, which would indicate that you know deciding on what this list list of differentiating factors and maybe an actual simple brand position. Um, isn't going to that that so-called brand position isn't necessarily static. It's going to change over time as you have experience. You also mentioned the significance of observation and then feedback. Uh, we talked about assessing the market as well, but these things are going to all happen over time, and it gives you the opportunity to be able to make adjustments to your brand based mm-hmm. on the experience, based on the feedback. It's so important to be open to feedback, to set ego aside, and to find out what it is that clients felt engaging with your brand what they'd like to see more of or maybe less of and having those conversations on an ongoing basis, looking online uh, to see what clients are talking about. It's, these are all really important factors to establishing a, a brand position and ultimately differentiating yourself from another business. But I, I am curious, and you've kind of alluded to this already, I think, Mike, but what it, what does your business look like now with these ideas in mind versus maybe before you had established that? Did it has it changed the way that your business functions on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, I would say just overall, and I kind of already mentioned this, is I'm just more, much more intentional uh, and focused in, in my business and in my interaction with my clients. So if I'm, if I'm branding myself on response time, you know, in the past, I might have taken I, – I, I would have clients email me and say, when am I going to get my photos Yeah, back – you know, in the past, or I'd let emails sit for a really long time and then respond to them when I got to it. But once I started branding myself on response time, you know, even right before this, this interview, a client around 930 emailed me about uh, a timeline question. She basically, she wanted me to, to lay out the timeline for the day. And I could have been like, Oh, I'll get to that. But, um, I responded right away and gave her a timeline within about 10 minutes of her email. So it's, it's just now so ingrained in the back of my mind that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at all of these things and uh, trying to consistently deliver on them now, whereas before it was like, oh, maybe I'd respond to an email quickly at yeah. one point, but then maybe let one sit for three days or maybe I'd deliver a wedding in three weeks and then another one in a month and a half where it's all, it was all just kind of nebulous and whatever I felt like at the moment. But now it's a very intentional knowing uh, my brand position and, and I want to deliver on that consistently. You know, Tony Robbins talks about the significance of, of values and values are these, these deep seated ideas that actually have kind of an emotional or that generate an emotional response from you. And if you're very clear about who you want to be as an individual and then begin to kind of weave those concepts, those ideas, ultimately those values into the way that you run your business, that the motivational factor goes way up for actually following through on those those ideas, those principles, right? So when you're talking about how you want to make sure that you're not intrusive, for example, that's a reflection of who you are for one reason or another. We could explore the psychology if we wanted to, but 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 that is a driving, it's, a, it's obviously important to you for one reason or another, and, and so important that it actually motivates you to do something in your business uh, as a result. And so when when we're recommending to our listeners to come up with this list of differentiating factors, ultimately a brand position, that brand position should be driven not only by the marketplace, but also by your values and what is truly most important to you because you're more likely to actually follow through, to have the motivation to follow through and delivering on those values and that brand position if, if you go about it that way. So I, I want to leave our listeners with, with that idea before we jump into really our, our last question here, because it's, you know, it's one thing to establish a brand position for ourselves, but then you have to be able to effectively communicate it to potential clients or to clients. And so I'm curious, what does it look like for you? How do you effectively communicate and ultimately live out this, this brand position or these differentiating factors with your clients? Yeah, it's, it's very practical 
you know, nothing mind blowing or revolutionary, but I, I look at all of the touch points uh, in client interaction. So anybody that wants to do this exercise, you basically just write down and say, what are all the touch points with a client? Hmm. It starts with, they hear about you. Then you hope whatever they hear is good, that they want to go to your website. Once they're on your website, you hope they send you an email. Then you respond and then you set up a wedding meeting. You hope they book pre, you know, you, th- that whole process, like there's this flow that people come through. Um, so what I do is I just take my eight branding points that I, I have as my foundation. And I look at every touch point in that client interaction process. And I ask myself, can I implement and kind of weave those things throughout all of those touch points? So, you know, on my website, the, the reviews that I list or the you know, one sentence things that I have on like my splash page images, what we have in our bio, the images that I post, you know, I look at all of that stuff and say, is this going to reflect my brand? And then once, you know, then I hope they, it does well enough that they send me an email. So when I get that email, I'm, I'm responding quickly. I'm supporting my brand and some of the things that I say. And then I'm, I'm ultimately with that email, I'm trying to get a face to face. So I always end my emails with a question, which is, would you like to meet up to discuss what I offer in more detail? Um, some people end their emails with like, hope to hear from you. Uh, <laughs> but that's not, you gotta, you gotta ask them a question to respond to. Otherwise you're, you're just leaving it out there and hoping that they'll respond back. Interesting. Yeah. I actually love evaluating people's email responses because I think the initial inquiry response is one of one of the biggest hurdles people put in the way to having connecting with a client. They're giving them too much information, too much like they're doing all these links in the email for things for them to look at. They're including detailed pricing where that initial email, the only goal is to get a connection with the client and then start to give all of the rest of that information. But if you give them a half an hour worth of work, in that initial email that they have to do before they respond to you, you're, you're going to lose them. So it's a little, little passionate side tangent that I, <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's so funny you say that too, because I'm thinking about the, the email that I sent to you yesterday with the information for today's podcast and that there's so much in there. And I've been kind of self-aware, if you will, of this for the last little while. I'm thinking like, man, if I put too much information in an email, while it's all relevant and helpful and important, um, it may also come across overwhelming and then what's the likelihood that the person reading that email is going to actually not only read it, but then also be able to take it in effectively and do something about it. Uh, this is a really interesting talking point. Yeah. And, I, and once you're, once there's an engagement, so if I get an email, an inquiry, um, and then I respond back to them and then they respond back to me. Now there's like investment on their end because they've already now sent me two emails. So then I can start to maybe have some longer emails or things like that. But yeah, it's, I, I feel it's mainly in that very initial inquiry response. Got it. If somebody has this, like I read through your whole thing because I knew I was going to be on the podcast and we already had a dialogue going, but sure. prior to the dialogue happening, that initial inquiry response has to be very simple and uh, end with a question. Cause you know, how many times do we check our phone uh, when we're in line at the grocery store or when we're, you know, in the parking lot waiting to pick somebody up or going to the bathroom? I'll admit we all we all check our phone. Right. You know, it's these small slivers of time. And so you want to have emails that somebody can respond when they're in that in-between time of their day, you know, just be able to respond quickly. So, yeah, then then from there... The wedding meeting is kind of the, that's the like lay it all out. I have them in person. So I actually have a slideshow that I walk through image by image and I'm showing images that uh, reflect my non-intrusive approach. I'm showing images that reflect my creativity or use of light. I show images from the last seconds of the reception to talk about all day wedding coverage and the value of me being there till the, the very end. Um, and then even within my contract, I, I have things in there about 
helping them with their timeline to show that I'm a wedding day expert and I can help them create a timeline or um, completion schedule to show that I'm going to be responsive and get their images there quickly. Um, yeah. And then on the wedding day, I'm, I'm following through with all of those things, not being intrusive and being easy to work with and easygoing, being creative. And then just overarching to everything, the ultimate goal, one is client satisfaction, but then also that if I'm communicating these branding points effectively throughout the client interaction process, at the end of it, they should now have specific things to say about me. So rather than saying, oh, you should check out Morby Photography. He's amazing. They're saying, oh, you should check out Morby Photography. Their, their use of light is unlike anything I've seen. They yeah. stayed at the end of the wedding. They always respond quickly to emails. Interesting. Somebody's much more likely, because that in the client interaction process, step number one is them hearing about us. And if they're hearing specific things that are of value, they're much more likely to go to my website than, oh, my photographer was amazing. Because that, that real goal is you get people out there saying things about you because then you want them to be so um, interested in what you have to offer that they're going to go and check out your website on the phone, yeah. you know, all of that sort of stuff. Oh man, that's this is a very long winded answer. No, but that's really good. And I love how you kind of brought us full circle back to the original definition for you of what a brand position is, which is not only a differentiating factor, but one that actually adds value. And, and, you know, we've talked multiple times at this point about the idea of, of specificity and, and, and actually also, I think you mentioned the word intentional earlier, the significance of being intentional, as much as it's a cliche word these days, it has some real value to it. And so, again, being very clear about what's important to you as an individual should then translate to your business and the model that you're running, including that brand position, making sure that that part of that position is to add actually add very specific value and your brand position should represent that. And then, I mean, you pointed out these different touch points, Mike, um, you know, first of all, just when they hear about you and, and again, it, it's kind of a circular uh, process, but they hear about you, it's, it drives them hopefully to your website where you have the real first kind of tangible touch point and then to email and then the face-to-face meetings and on the wedding day and that you're actually working because you have a clear idea of what it is that you're trying to communicate as a brand to that client. You can very intentionally go about consistently delivering on that, uh, Mm -hmm. which is, is so, so important. So I, man, I, I love a practical conversation where our listeners can really truly take something away. And this has been one of the most valuable conversations we've had about brand position to date. I really, really appreciate you sharing what you've learned. And and if you will, just briefly share with our listeners one more time where they can follow uh, online, both your photography business. And then if you have resources that we can link to as well for your workshops or education, that would be great too. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, Instagram is Morby Photography. Um, then morbyphotography.com is my website. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have any workshops coming up uh, there, but there is a, a link on there that somebody can be put on the email list if, if something does come up. We're actually in the, in the midst of launching some side businesses that are keeping us pretty occupied, but I hope to get back to do a workshop sometime you know, within the next year or so. But um, yeah, I actually don't have any really online resources as far as uh, business goes, but um I've always thought about doing that, but as you know, that, that takes a lot of time. <laughs> it definitely can. Well, this is going to be a massive resource in and of itself for our listeners. And so to that point, I, I really appreciate, truly appreciate you making time to share all this information with our listeners. We will link to Mike's site, Morby Photography, M-O-R-B-Y photography.com. And then to Instagram as well, also Morby Photography in our show notes, bookapodcast.com. We'll also link to the, um, it, it's under an other services link there on the on the site business workshops and as mike pointed out you can go and register there uh, if you'd like to just kind of keep up to date with information regarding any potential education coming up but once again thank you so much mike for making time for the book of podcast community yeah thanks for having me i really appreciate it thanks so much for listening to the book of podcast today will you let us know what you think by leaving a review of the podcast in itunes or maybe in the apple podcast app And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast, maybe suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My direct email is nathan at photographersedit.com. 
The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com.